And this text verse is really only one of three. This will be the third sermon that I'm doing on the altar. And it came out of Trisha getting a word from God about the theme for our fast this year, which started in, on January 6th. How many participated in the fast? Was it worth it? Yeah. It's good stuff, right? And definitely was worth it for me, too. And part of what she did was she was writing an article for Chuck Pierce, actually. And she asked me to read it and, and go through and edit it. And one of the things that she wrote in there really struck because as a worship leader, I've studied this portion of scripture before, but it really was highlighted. Do you ever notice how God will do that when you're reading something and all of a sudden it's like he takes his big hand and puts a highlighter over that thing? And, and that's what he did because she wrote that we can't bring offerings to God that don't cost us something. And that's a scriptural principle. And that was the theme of uh, that first round that we did called the Priceless Altar of Christ. And it was based on 2 Samuel 24, 24. I will not sacrifice to the Lord offerings that cost me nothing. Because then it's not a sacrifice, is it? But what does that mean in practical day-to-day, -day, Monday through Friday language? Is that maybe we have started to lean on something that works for us, but God is asking us to stop unforgiveness could be a good one of those. You're holding aught in your heart towards somebody, and there's a certain amount of joy you get out of keeping them dangling. And, and you're benefiting from it because they're miserable, and, and you're liking that. And that's not godly, is it? So he's asking you to give that up, and, and you have to actually ask them to forgive you, or you have to forgive them, probably in that case that I gave. And you don't want to, but it has to die. God's saying, if you want to move forward in me, there's going to be things I'm going to ask you to surrender, Abraham. <laughs> what do you mean, God? That's the promise. No, I want you to surrender the most valuable thing because I want to see if you trust me. And then there was that awesome scripture in Hebrews that said, Abraham did it because he knew that God could raise Isaac from the dead. Even if he had killed him, God could raise Isaac from the dead. Sometimes partying with money can feel that way, right? Oh, I'll never get it back. And then all of a sudden, something comes in the mail you weren't expecting. Or a refund, bigger refunds coming or whatever. It's countless times we've heard people talk about that, right? How an unexpected thing happens and how God proves himself to us. So he's saying it's not really a sacrifice if it's not costing you something. And it's because he loves us. And anybody who's played sports or been involved with any competitive athletics, you know, it's very hard to practice and go through all of the work that it takes. It's no pain, no gain, they say, in the world. Why would it be any different in the kingdom? We're born into a corrupted culture, a corrupted world. It's not nearly as bad today, frankly, as it was when Jesus was alive. But to think that we could just operate clearly and easily as a kingdom person in this culture on the East Coast near New York City, it's going to take some surrender we're going to have to surrender some things to God that we thought were valuable, and he shows us no. Because if it's not valuable to you, then it's really not a sacrifice. You get it? And that's part of what the altar does, is you get down on your knees and you say, Lord, I want to do it your way today. What are my marching orders? He might say, I want you to move in this direction. And that's going to cause you to have to leave something else behind. It's okay, because I have something better for you, but you have to trust me. Abraham went... Hebrews 11, 8, not knowing where he was going. That's, that's called faith, right? So that was step one. And then step two would be that next slide. It was called, I am the dwelling place of God's presence. That was based on Ephesians chapter 2, verse 22 in the Passion Translation. And why I'm saying this is I'm not going to rehash all these, but you can go on our YouTube channel or our Facebook page and you can find these and say, yeah, maybe I should brush up if it's a three-part series then uh, I, can, I can get the first, a reminder of what, what he covered in the first two parts. But the idea is just stunning, right, that God's presence dwells on the inside of me. And, and it's, it's so easy in the course of our busyness and the different amount of obligations that we take on to get caught up in the doing and forget about the fact that I'm ignoring this amazing source of power and strength and insight that's already right inside of me because I haven't prayed. And, you know, I don't know about you, but when I first became a Christian, praying seemed a little dry to me. I was raised in a denominational structure that really didn't emphasize prayer. And I thought you were just reading off a list of things to God and you were asking like Santa Claus at Christmas. I need this. I need that. I need this. No, what I've come to understand is that altar is the most important place in my life 
that when I get on my knees in the morning and I say, I need a download from heaven today, God. I don't want to hear my voice. I want to hear your voice. I need you to speak to me because I don't want to do it my way. I've learned the hard way. That doesn't work. And what the connection came to me, the formula was, when I wasn't hearing God's voice, it was hard for me to pray because it was an empty half hour or however much time I was putting in there. But once I started learning how to hear his voice, I wanted to go to it. I want to get down on my knees because I'm expecting him like a good father to speak to me. Are you? That's what I'm asking you. Are you expecting him to speak to you at your altar? Because what the temple was to Israel was the place where God met his people. And he lived in that place called the Holy of Holies. So it's where earth and heaven met and the priests would stand in the middle. But now you don't have to go to a building for that. You are that place. You have the temple. That's why I wrote that title. I am the dwelling place of God's presence. And in Ephesians, it says, you are now the Holy of Holies. Huh, that's a big responsibility, isn't it? I have to be careful what I watch, where I go, who I hang out with, what I ingest into my body. And, and if I'm not treating it like a temple, his presence has to depart because then it's not holy anymore. Well, that could get real legalistic, couldn't it? But not if you're saying, I would never put something over the importance of having God's presence in my life. You're trying to steal from me, devil. You're trying to cheat with some counterfeit. Yeah, it looks good. Sin always looks good. But I am not allowing the voice of God to be robbed from my life because I've learned how important it is to hear his voice. Amen. Amen. And, and that's what it said in Ephesians 2.22. The next slide says, God is transforming each one of you into the holy of holies, the dwelling place through the power of the Holy Spirit living in you. I'm going to hit it again and again and again today. This is the third time I'm talking about this because it's so important that we see the value of prayer, that we see the value of the altar, that we get on our knees in the morning early, and before we eat food, we have communion. And I'm not making a legalistic practice out of it. I'm just saying this is a healthy sign of somebody who has their priorities in the right place, that they're not trying to go out and figure it out on their own. But I'm submitting myself, right physically, I'm getting down on my knees and I'm submitting myself to you. And I'm saying, I recognize this vessel that you've given me is a temple of your presence, corrupted by sin, but redeemed by the blood of the Lamb. And if I forget and I stop praying and I stop getting in the Word, it's so easy to shift back. I remember working in New York City, I got transferred to a different office and I was sitting on one of those big trading floors. And I was used to having an office. And now all of a sudden, I'm out on this big trading floor, and the F-bombs that were dropping left and right around me. Now, you know, like, look, you don't want to be church lady in a situation like that. Like, I was, a team, I was with the Teamsters all day when I was working for the family business, so it's not like I never heard this stuff. It wasn't usually women doing it, but they don't mind anymore. And it's very defiling. But... Before you know it, you're walking around and you're starting to hear them in your head. And that's defiling my brain. Now, uh-uh, devil. You don't get to do that. I'm not going to be listening to no secular songs when I could be having a hundred worship songs going in my brain. Because the secular songs lead me towards sin. And it's real subtle. So, thank you. Let's go to that next picture because it's just, again, I'm trying to help give you a picture of what the Lord's been showing me about this topic. And you all know that, right, that that is uh, in the, the camp of the Israelites as they were going through in the book of Exodus. It describes their trip through Egypt, and God gave them very specific instructions, and he wanted the tabernacle in the center of the camp. What does that tell you? That Jesus has to be the center of your life, Okay. Yeah, we are the tribes together as one, but if he's supposed to be in the center, that's where he's supposed to be for us. What's your ground zero for your life? Your center of gravity is Jesus Christ. That's who we look to. That's our compass of true north. That's the gravitational pull that pulls me, not sin, not the world, not the things I'm good at in the world that are not redeemed. But we can redeem what's in the world. And all the tribes surrounded this... Um, Three stages of the tabernacle, the outer court, the holy place, and then the holy of holies. You could do a whole study on that. But if you go to the next slide, you can see it at a higher level now. And I want you to just picture something because one of the teachers who influenced me really big time when I was a younger Christian 
gave me this picture one time. He said, what if you overlaid the cross over the whole picture of all the tribes? Because it's not, a, it's not exactly a cross uh, equally proportioned, is it? Because the tabernacle is longer. It's a rectangle. So uh, just picture with me laying the cross of Christ over the top of that picture. Where would his heart be? Right where the Holy of Holies is. Right where the altar sits, right? So doesn't that tell you something about your own personal altar? This is where he dwells. Guard your heart, the Bible says, for out of it flow the issues of life. Mine is important, but this can get a download of new software <laughs> called the Word of God. I could be transformed. I could transform my mind by the Word of God. My heart, on the other hand, that's more of a spirit issue, isn't it? Because that's about our attitudes, and that's about what we think about ourselves, and why we had those words this morning is about somebody's thinking they're sterile, because that's the lie the enemy's given. You won't reproduce. You're not, you're not going to get what you think you're going to get. Well, of course he wants us to believe that. But the more you're spending time with the Lord, and you can think, well, I just don't have that much time. It's not the amount. Yes, it's great to have a lot of time, but are you acknowledging him, or has it been weeks since I sat down and said, I, I need to hear your voice, Lord. I'm blocking out the time that I do have because I need to hear from you. Right? And he's not Scrooge. He's perfect in all of his ways. Perfect in all of your ways. Right? You're perfect in all of your ways to us. You're good, good father. Hey, well, if you believe that, Yes, I believe that's who he is. He's not going to make me sit there for 10 hours in silence unless that's what I need. <laughs> it might have been so long since I've been trying to hear from him that it's going to take a while. Well, you know, he's not punishing you. He's just trying to get you in the right frequency so that you can hear his voice. But if you love your children, you're communicating with them, them often. But you really love it when they call you and ask you for your opinion about something. All right, so that brings us back to where we're starting today, which is that the stones, this picture of the face of Jesus and looking almost like a wall, right? Looks like bricks in a wall. And that's all of us, again, like that's, that's what this verse is saying. Come be his living stones being built into the temple of God. And if you could try to keep that picture in your mind as we go to the next slide, it, it expands on it a bit. It's in 1 Peter chapter 2, and it says, keep coming to him who is the living stone. The living stone is Jesus. He's at the center of the camp. You, you lay the cross over. When you get in that altar of your life, you are in his heart. That's what you're doing. You're guarding your heart. Your mind's real important. You renew your mind by the word, but your heart is strengthened by hearing the voice of God and sensing the power and the presence of the Holy Spirit. So coming, keep coming, it says. Keep coming to him who's the living stone, though he was rejected and discarded by men, but chosen by God and is priceless in God's sight. You don't need any other. Jesus is the one, okay? He is priceless. And now you don't just have the image of Jesus. You have his spirit living on the inside of you, and you've been adopted into their family, Holy Spirit and Jesus, with the same father. And you can call him Abba, Daddy, not angry God ready to punish me because I made a mistake. He's daddy. Come be his living stones who are continually being assembled into the sanctuary, into a sanctuary for God. And, and that's where that picture of the face of Jesus, that's what it's like. We're all fitting together. Each one of you adds something to my life by being here. You believe that? Yeah, and not, not stress. <laughs> You're not adding agita, what the Italians would say. You add a blessing to my life because we're all together. And you never know when one person or another is going to be the person for you that day. There used to be a show called Candid Camera, and the tagline was, when you least expect it, you're elected. Smile. You're on Candid Camera, right? And that's how the Holy Spirit works with us in the body of Christ. And sometimes it's the least expected person that you would ever think could have a word from God for you. And part of that word is, God wants you to think of, you could get words from more people than you think. Could be a four-year-old kid giving you a word. There's no restrictions on Holy Spirit, right? I'm going to keep going. We'll go to the 1 Corinthians 6. That's one that says the war for your altar up there at the top. It's real important to 
hear what Paul is saying. Now, his first Corinthians, first letter to the Corinthians, it was a very secular church. There are other churches that were mostly populated by Jews who accepted Jesus as the Messiah, but Corinth was a very secular Greek city, and they did not have a lot of Jewish knowledge of the Word of God. They didn't know the Bible. So when you read Corinthians, the first letter especially, you see he's correcting a lot of things. And it's understandable. It's like, you know, New York City, secular version, port city, a lot of money, all different temples of different gods in that city. And all of a sudden, the church gets a foothold. And there's signs and wonders. It's not that surprising that the people wouldn't know how to regulate the effect of that power in their lives. Because you get Holy Spirit in you, you could become Frankenstein. You could start prophesying to girls that they have to marry you. Because thus says the Lord. Never worked well on Trish, I could tell you. <laughs> Might have told you, but didn't tell me. You heard a spirit, but it wasn't God. <laughs> <laughs> So look at this key in verse 12, 1 Corinthians 6. I'm free to do as I choose, but I choose to never be enslaved to anything. <laughs> you, you should say that, man. I choose to never be enslaved to anything. It's tricky, though. It's like the frog in the kettle. You know, the devil's such a good liar. He appears as an angel of light, and he gets you to do things. And before you know it, you're 10 steps down the road. You didn't even think you started yet. But it's a mental thing. He's getting in here, and, it, and it's a hard thing. He knows how to exploit the wounds of our heart. Some have said, I eat to live, and I live to eat. Well, that speaks to appetite, and we could take the idea of appetite well beyond just food, right? What's my appetite for pornography? Zero, I hope. But if you have a big appetite for that, look, this isn't like a gray area. It's not one of the 50 shades of gray. You shouldn't be looking at pornography. It's identified clear to sin period. How about being drunk? Not gray. It's a sin. You're out of control. You open yourself up to all kinds of spirits. Could you have a drink? Yes, absolutely. You could have a drink and not be drunk. But once you get drunk, you know, I can't help but say it. They even name the liquor stores unlimited spirits. How much more obvious could it be? I, it's just blatant. It's right there. Blinking sign. Unlimited spirits. No thanks. I got enough problems. You know, just get drunk and I'll open myself up to like hordes of them coming in. No, thanks. Anyway, I'll pass on that wonderful opportunity you're offering me, devil. Uh, it's my appetite. Can I draw the line? When I used to drink, I couldn't. I, I couldn't stop after I had a few and I would really regret it. So I said, you know what? I'm kind of simple. If I don't have the first one, I can't have the 10th one. This is really good math. <laughs> Your call, how you want to handle that one. Because then he goes from appetites, eating, to sex. And he says, the body was not created. Right, I didn't read that one part. It said, God will do away with all. Eat to live, live to eat. God will do away with it all. The body was not created for illicit sex, but to serve and worship our Lord Jesus. Who can what? Fill the body with himself. Has he filled your body with himself? Is there a little bit more room you could give them? Please say yes. Yes, all of us could say that, right? And the room has to be made by the things he wants us to get rid of, by the sacrifices he wants us to give. It doesn't mean you're a terrible person, and it doesn't mean it's going to be a massive change in your personality. But he said, pick up your cross. No, I'm sorry. Pick up my cross, Jesus said, daily. It's the one that we have to own. It's not these major, huge problems that you have. It's all the little fine-tuning. I'm being transformed into his image with ever-increasing glory, which comes from the Lord. There's not one thing a good, good father wouldn't still be able to say, I love how you're doing, Sam, but have you thought about this? When I was praying for you, the Lord showed me this about your life. And, and it's like, speak into my life, Dad. Speak into my life. I'm part of your genes. You could speak to me with authority that no one else has. Who wouldn't want that? Got to get to the altar. Got to hear his voice. And he's never not talking to us because he loves us. Hmm. Say la. What's my appetites? Do I have an appetite for the voice of God or the stimulation that the world's offering me? Not legalism. And then in Matthew 11:11 11, 11, it says, 
Among those born of women, there is not risen one greater than John the Baptist, but he who is least in the kingdom of heaven is greater than John, greater than he. What would that mean? John the Baptist technically was an Old Testament prophet, right? Because he died before Jesus resurrected. You could say die before Jesus was crucified, but you really should say after he was resurrected is when it changed. Because just dying on the cross didn't get it done. That didn't defeat death. That's our victory as death has been defeated. It's when he rose from the grave. That's what changed. Was the cross important? Of course. That's the altar. That's our sacrifice. But Paul says, without the resurrection, your faith is in vain. Right? So let's not forget that and keep it. So look, what's different about us than John is we have Holy Spirit. Greater is he that's just in the kingdom today on this side of the resurrection than John, the greatest prophet in the Old Testament. But don't undervalue that is all I'm saying. You know, if God's given you this superpower source, don't use it to destroy yourself. Or don't neglect it for the fake power that the enemy gives you. And he does have fake power. Like, we know that, right? It wouldn't be a temptation if there wasn't some power behind it, but it's a dark power. Yeah. All right, I could really go off on that one. I will say this, like, and um, I don't know. I think it's important to remember. Just go back to the garden. You have Adam and Eve in the garden. 100% pure relationship with God. No sin, no death. Then they sin. And the devil says, you won't surely die, which is true. They didn't die from eating the fruit, but they brought death into the kingdom. Jesus comes and is resurrected, and now Holy Spirit comes 50 days later, and now we have a taste in small part, a down payment of what Adam and Eve felt what it was like to be in fellowship with God. Some people in the Old Testament had it too because it would say the Spirit of God would fall on people for a season. Samson, David, so many people, it says they did great exploits when the Spirit of God came upon them. The prophets, Elijah, reading people's mail. Isn't that cool? They thought there was a spy in the camp, and it's like, no, it's the prophet. He, he, he knows what you say in your bedroom. Wow. <laughs> They took his body and threw it in a tomb, and the dead body that was in there, just with the dead body of the prophet came springing back to life. That's some resonance. There was resonance on the, that dead body because the Spirit of God was in there. We have that Spirit. Ho! Oh, let's not flaunt it and let's not neglect it. We're not using it for winning the lottery. Lord, show me the winning number tomorrow. I'll give it all to church. Really? You think God needs you to do that? He doesn't, okay? He doesn't need you to do that. So there's three stages. We had the purity, the perfection in the garden. Then we had the sin in the garden. It says the wages of sin, even though you didn't die by eating that fruit, you brought death in, and every living thing, therefore, has to die. The wages of sin is death. That's what that sin did. Jesus comes and shows us a redemption and forgiveness, but it's still a choice of ours. But when he comes back for the final version, we're all going to be what Adam and Eve had in the garden. So you have this beautiful hope right now of saying, I don't have what I will have in completion, but I have way more than they had prior when John the Baptist was alive, prior to the resurrection. That released the vault of heaven. Remember now, veil of the temple was torn in two from top to bottom when Jesus gave up the spear. Boom, sound, cracks, rocks crack open. It's probably a lot like when God spoke the world into existence. Or on the day of Pentecost, a sound like a mighty rushing wind. Because when there's a release from heaven, it is finished. And now people pop up out of the graves. That's a power surge, man. That's a sunspot. You know, a flare on the sun, right? It could knock out our power grids. But we still have a greater version coming. Oh, man, when he comes back, it's game over for the devil, okay? So I am uh, trying to encourage you that life is not easy, but God gave you tools, all right? 
That's what it means to be part of the body of Christ. You're looking at people around you that could be a tool of, of redemption in your life, who could give you a word. The older women, take, help take care of the younger women. Give them some of your knowledge. Speak into their lives. That's what the Bible tells us, right? Have mentors. Be accountable to other people. Don't just live a solo life as a Christian. You need their experience. You need how they've seen the Bible in their lives. And why wouldn't we have that with each other? Don't be unequally yoked with the world. They're not going to feed you the right kind of food. Don't ignore them. They, they need to hear the good news, but don't be influenced by them. Amen? All right, good. So I'm going to keep going. Let's go to the next slide. It says, don't you know that your bodies belong to Christ as his body parts? Do you know that? All right, so when you became a Christian, you were purchased out of slavery to sin by the blood of Jesus. So you were on the slave auction and not meaning to be insensitive to people here. I really don't know what that would have been like. We saw the movie Harriet, and uh, I highly recommend it. But I was never a slave. I don't, I don't know the first-hand uh, account of that. But we were sold into sin by the enemy, and Jesus came and redeemed us by his blood. I give the highest price I can give. The perfect life from heaven was given to purchase your life. And don't neglect that. And say, ah, well, was it that valuable? Oh, really? Yeah, you may not be experiencing the fullness of what he wants you to have, but it's available if you tap into it. And I do want to tap in it. So I do know that my body is, is your body part, Lord, because I'm part of the body of Christ. And then he says in 19, have you forgotten that your body is now the sacred temple of the spirit of holiness who lives in you? You don't belong to yourself any longer for the gift of God. The Holy Spirit lives inside your sanctuary. You were God's expensive purchase. Paid for with tears of blood. That was in the garden. He was sweating blood. And he gave everything he had so that I could be saved. So use your body to bring glory to God. Hmm. Quite a few things we could just pause on there, right? But I, I, just, I think you understand where I'm coming from here is that just because he's inside us doesn't mean we give him proper place. Holy Spirit. That's what I'm saying. I want you to have a relationship with him where you aren't thinking that you're bothering him with something. Or he's going to say, be a missionary to Africa. You have to leave tomorrow. <laughs> That's what so many people are worried about. They don't want to be around prophetic people. Oh, what if they call me out? I have this secret sin in my life, and they're going to call me out. Believe me, we're not bringing people in here that would ever do that to you, okay? And none of our team would ever do that to you. We would talk to you separately in a kind way and say, have you considered whatever, fill in the blank? But nobody's ever going to call you out that way here with our permission anyway because we know the people that come through here, right? But how valuable is it to have people who are hearing like that from God? How are you holding up, okay? All right, 12 o'clock, Isaiah 4. That means we're rounding second fast towards third. <laughs> I don't know if you've ever seen this in Isaiah 4. The Old Testament has so many beautiful predictions of Jesus. And Isaiah 4, verse 4 says, the Lord has washed away the filth of the daughters of Zion and cleansed the bloodstains of Jerusalem by a spirit of justice and by a spirit of burning. Can you connect it to what happened this morning around the altar and the prophetic word that came forth about the cleansing that was going to happen and the shame that was on people's lives and that word I had about being sterile and, and then the pregnancy when, when, when you're coming, it's not, not in the natural realm, right? We're talking about an idea, a birthing. When you're discouraged and you're full of shame, you don't want to try anything. But when you understand that ID that Martin talked about, the authentic identity in Christ, now all of a sudden... The devil's on the run because you're recognizing, no, I really do have something that I can offer. All those people that spoke death over me, that's gone. I have a new father now, not that one that spoke over me. Oh, then five says, Yahweh will create over all Mount Zion and over every gathering a cloud of smoke by day and a glow of flaming fire by night. If that's not a picture of them coming out of the slavery of Egypt, right? God provides for you. When your desire is to get out of slavery, he makes cloud, cloud by day, fire by night. He makes a way, an impossible way. The enemy couldn't see them because they were hidden in the cloud. So the devil's trying to get you. He can't see you because you're protected. You're under the shadow of the Almighty. <laughs> 
flaming smoke, I'm sorry, cloud of smoke by day, glow flame of fire by night. And this is for us that are out in the business world and, you know, having to operate in, in what you would say is unequally yoked kind of situations. Well, Paul purposely stayed in those places. He wanted to be with the unbelievers to bring the light of Christ to them. He didn't want to just hide in the bunker of the church. None of us are supposed to do that. We're supposed to get equipped to go out there and forcefully advance the kingdom of God as soldiers, as, as ambassadors of the kingdom, full of his power. And then I love this last part. It says, and all this manifestation of dazzling glory will spread over them like a wedding canopy. If you ever wondered if this was us, we are the bride of Christ. This is him. What a great verse to remember during your day. Yahweh will create over me a cloud of smoke by day, a glow of flaming fire by night, and all this manifestation will be like a wedding canopy over my life. Oh, personalize it. And then it will be a tabernacle as a shade from the scorching heat of the day, a safe shelter to protect them from the storm and rain. And this is your altar too. Like the altar is anywhere that you choose to meet with God. I've said it, I'm sorry if you've heard it before, but I used to go into the, the men's room at my office in New York City because there wasn't any place private I could go. And I would lock the stall and get on my knees in the stall. And I didn't care if somebody thought I was getting sick in the toilet. You know, too bad. Because all they would have seen was my legs, you know, like facing the toilet. I was praying. Could God use that place? Why not? He could use any place. All I wanted was some privacy. Sometimes you could go out in your car and listen to worship music and you could just, you know, get out of that whirlwind of chaos that's on the job and people ripping each other to shreds. And, and it could gets on you. It's like, no, 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 sorry. All my life you have been faithful. I'm going to go sit in my car and it'll be glowing and shaking with the power of God. And then I go back in. I'm like, okay, I'm refreshed. Let's have at it again. That's, that's your tabernacle, a shade from the scorching sin that's around you, a safe shelter to protect you from storm and rain. And then Brian Simmons, if you read the Passion Bible, he has a lot of notes, you know. So when he does a, a book of the Bible, you can go in the footnotes. I loved what he said. He says, there's coming a day when the church will become so destitute of answers that she will turn to one man, the Lord Jesus Christ. All right? And we are the church. But the church, you could argue, is some that, you know, again, I hate to judge or talk bad about anybody, but if they're... If they're watering down the power of the word by, by accepting certain kinds of sin and saying it's okay because they don't want to lose people, then is that really the authentic church of Jesus, right? I don't want to get into that mess and, and, and argue with people about it, but when are we going to just turn and say, what did Jesus do? That's who we should be. We don't have to complicate this. I'll keep going, all right? 1 Peter 1.18. I would like you to say it after me, because let's make it personal. Say, my life was ransomed once for all people. Meditate on that for a minute, right? Your lives were ransomed once for all. We don't have to go back every year into the temple with bulls and goats and sacrifice and, and beg God to help, you know, forgive me this time. Once for all, for all time, one sacrifice. If that's not worth getting on your face in the morning and saying, I surrender again to you today, Lord, just in case you were wondering, I'm not wondering. I need you today. You're the most important thing in my life. And my wife would tell you that too. If you want to know what would make her the most happy is to know that I'm praying and reading the Bible and spending time with the Lord. She wouldn't care about a job promotion or all that if that wasn't in place because the world will use that and flip it over on you and use, use that gift against you. And what will you ransom from? <laughs> the empty and futile way of life that was handed down from generation to generation. So look, if your parents were Christians and you're raised a Christian, then that doesn't really apply to you, right? But many of us weren't. How many of you weren't raised that way? Like a lot of hands going up, right? So if we had just plugged into that older way of life, it was empty and futile if it, if it was absent the gospel, right? So I've been ransomed from that. I now have a better way to live my life. Is it easy? No. It's not easy. But neither was the other way. You know, like, uh, wonderful quote. 
You know, being a disciple of Christ is going to cost you something, right? So discipleship is expensive. Try non-discipleship if you want to see expensive. How about losing everything to gambling and drugs and getting ripped off by people and being lied to on a regular basis? Sure, it takes discipline to serve the Lord, but the devil's not a good boss. I promise you that one. All right, so... We got ransom from the empty and feudal way of life that was handed down from generation to generation. It wasn't a ransom payment of silver and gold, which eventually perishes, but your ransom payment was the precious blood of Christ, like a spotless, uh, spotless unblemished lamb, a sacrifice for us. And how that uh, translates to me, I've got a communion cup up here, is when you get on your knees in the morning and you're praying, it could be right on your job. You know, I, I was the first one in the office, so I could do it right at my desk. And I would just get there right there, and I, and I would remember this verse and say, wait a minute, this represents that. This cup represents the precious blood of Christ, a spotless lamb who was sacrificed for me. So anything I need on this job today, Lord, you're able to provide me. It's when I disconnect from that and start counting on my own abilities and my own logic and my own reasoning. And I read this book by Tony Robbins, this, and... I'm sure it's good stuff, but the Bible's better. <laughs> Tony Robbins didn't hang on the cross for you. And he also didn't resurrect from the tomb either. So slight difference. Next one, we're almost done. A couple more to go. And then we'll do a group thing. Your new life, Peter, is not like your old life. Your old birth came from a sinful, mortal seed. Your new birth comes from God's living word. It's alive and powerful. God spoke and the worlds came into order. That spirit came down. Sound of a mighty rushing wind. When he came into your life, things changed. The old chaff got blown out. And then the wheat was still there. Just think, a life conceived by God himself. That's why the prophet said, this is the message Bible. The old life is a grass life. Little did he know I smoke pot, right? So that would have really been true. It's not what he means here. Its beauty is short-lived as wildflowers. Grass dries up and flowers droop. God's word goes on forever. <laughs> Whole better, better plan. Better plan. This is the word that conceived the new life in you. All right, just two more. Yeah, just two more. Maybe, maybe we could stand for this. And act out what we're reading. I think it'd be good if we just, you know, you look at what I'm reading and then we'll make it personal. It says, you are rising, which you just did. You just rose. Like the perfectly fitted stones of the temple. And your lives are being built upon... I'm sorry, built up together upon the ideal foundation laid by the apostles and the prophets, okay? So that's a good word picture, isn't it? We're rising up together. The, the Lord globally is building the body of Christ. It continues to grow. Maybe not as much in America. We might not see as much growth here, but in other parts of the world, it's exploding because it's clearly the best option, definitely happening in China, right? So there's seasons where you have fits and starts, but the body of Christ is growing. And it says, you're rising like the perfectly fitted stones of the temple, and your lives are being built up together upon the ideal foundation laid by the apostles and prophets. And best of all, you are connected to the head, cornerstone of the building, the anointed one, Jesus Christ himself. Drug addict, Wall Street guy, could be the same, by the way. Uh, level of education, zero or a bunch, doesn't matter. You could be a hurting person no matter where you are, and you need redeeming. He's not saying anybody's too far away. Anybody can come in and be part of this building. Are there requirements to be part of the building? Yes, absolutely. He's not saying anything goes. That's called cheap grace in some circles, right? No such thing. His life was not cheap. Grace was purchased by his blood, right? So we have to have a holiness standard, but it can't be based on fear. It's got to be based on love. So I don't know if you're up for this, but try it. Look at somebody near you and say it. You can repeat after me. One person, just look at one person near you. I'll look at you, Trish. All right, you got Terry. Good. No, I won't bail. I won't bail on Terry. All right, you don't have to read it. Just say it after me. You 
are rising like the perfectly fitted stone of the temple. And your life is being built upon together on the ideal foundation laid by the apostles and the prophets. And the best of all, you are connected to the head cornerstone of the building, the anointed one, Jesus Christ himself. Now, don't you feel better? I definitely feel better. But now, I want you to make it personal. Say this after me. I am rising like the perfectly fitted stones of the temple. My life is being built upon together on the ideal foundation laid by the apostles and prophets. And best of all, I am connected to the head cornerstone of the building, the anointed one, Jesus Christ himself, regardless of what other people say about me. It doesn't matter what they say. This is what I say. I'm connected to the cornerstone of the building, Jesus Christ himself. Whew.